Hey, Basic Alex students, this is going to be day 20 notes. We've got Rolls Theorem and Mean Value Theorem to talk about today. So we'll get into those in a little bit, but there is quite a bit of actually just a recap of where we're at so far. And the entire first page really has some good recap of differentials and linearization to start. So I do want you to approach this from both techniques, making sure that you feel confident that if it said, find this approximation using differentials, we would know how to do that versus finding the approximation using linearization. So I'd like you to try that before I see you in class next time. We'll go over both techniques, make sure you're good to go as far as that's concerned. Number two, we've seen tables that look like this before. I feel like we've approached this when we've talked about, you know, special ideas with product rule and quotient rule. And this one I think will be a little unique that if Y equals capital F of X and X is equal to G of T, we wanna find dy dt at t equals one, given the information in the table. So my quick hint is, if we have y equals f of x and x equals g of t, maybe I can come over here and think of it as f of g of t. All right, so that's my big hint for number two, that if you try this, now that we understand that x equals g of t, subbing in and over here is gonna help me find dy dt. That's enough that I want to give you about number two. And I also want you to read through number three. It seems like a complicated word problem situation, but I actually love the way this one turns out. I think it's pretty fascinating in the end. But the idea is that we're, there's a rope around the equator and people are standing behind the rope and they want to crawl underneath it. It's definitely weird, but I think it's a fascinating result that's an application of differentials. So... Go ahead and read through this. If it's not making sense, have no fear. We'll go over it next time I see you. But maybe if it does make sense, you can come up with um, how much we have to let this rope out so that all these people can crawl underneath it. Kind of weird. All right, let's take a look at some curve sketching. So we started our ideas of curve sketching about how we can use our first derivative test, our F prime number line, to be able to generate where a function's increasing and decreasing, find extrema, things of that nature. So let's go ahead and get started in this one by finding the first derivative. So y prime given y equals up there would be in this case using the power rule x squared and then minus 4x plus 3. So once I've generated my equation for the derivative there, we're going to wind up setting that equal to 0 and finding the critical points to partition around. So luckily, this is really nicely factorable into x minus 1 times x minus 3. So we're going to place 1 and 3 on the number line and then do some quick tests to see where we get positives and negatives, which tells me about increasing and decreasing. So if I test something to the left of 1, like testing 0, let's say, we get negative times negative, which is positive. So we know that the graph is increasing from negative infinity to 1. If I test two, you're gonna get positive times negative, which is negative. So then the graph switches over to decreasing. And then if I test four, we get positive times positive. So then we switch back over to increasing. So if we think about just making some quick conclusions here, we know that the graph of y, the original function, is increasing from negative infinity to one, and then from three to infinity. And we know it's decreasing in between those values from one to three. But of course this tells us so much more than just where it's increasing and decreasing. When we switch from increasing to decreasing, we know that at x equals one, we have a local max. So I want you to, when you write down why we have a local max at x equals one, to actually go through and make sure that you remember how we justify that. So we have a local max at x equals 1. Why is that the case? We have a local max at x equals 1 because, well, since the derivative at 1 equals 0, we know we have a horizontal tangent there, and f prime is greater than 0 to the left, and less than zero to the right, of one, x equal one, uh, equals one is a local max. 
So I realized that's so much more words than we ever typically use in math, unless you've taken AP stats or are currently taking AP stats. But this is the justification needed. If it says to justify why we have a local max or min, here's why, using the first derivative test. And for similar reasons, we have a local min then at x equals three. So very similarly, we can justify by saying since f prime of three equals zero, and the derivative is this time less than zero to the left and greater than zero to the right of three. X equals three is a local min. You know, if you don't use the exact same words that I've used here, it's not the end of the world, but it has to come pretty close. Right, if your justification falls short by not describing what's happening with your derivative, how those signs change to the left and right of x equals 3, you know, that's going to be insufficient in terms of our justification there. So just to be able to make a quick sketch here, you know, we, we know things like the end behavior of the graph. We know that since it's a positive lead coefficient, that the end behavior is going to be tail down on the right, tail up on, um, tail down on the left, and tail up on the right. As far as finding the x-intercepts, maybe that's not so easy to do in this case. It's not factorable. I don't know. It might be a little tough to find x-intercepts. But the y-intercept is 0, 2, so we can use some of those pre-calc skills to plot at least that point. And although we know a local max and min exists at these values, why don't we find the y-values that correspond with them? This way, we can plot them a little bit more accurately. So for the local max, if you plug in one to your function, okay, go back to the original. If you plug in one, the output winds up being three and a third or 10 thirds. And the local min, when you plug in three to your original function, winds up being two. So based on having our local max, our local min coordinate, the y-intercept, I'm feeling pretty confident that we can make a sketch. We know where it's increasing, where it's decreasing. We know about the end behavior. We've got a lot of solid information to get a very accurate sketch of the curve. All right, so we've got 0, 2 is my y ints. We've got 1 10 third, or yep, 10 thirds, so 3 and a third ish. There's my local max. Local min over here at 3, 2. So I know based on the end behavior, we'll at least have one real root, which we have to for a cubic anyway. I'm not too concerned where that is at this point. But, oops, I completely missed the y-intercept. Oops. All right. That's close enough. But, but it seems like we're going to have, in the end, if I were to find the roots, one real and then two complex, according to the fact that we have this local min here. So it's going to turn around at the min and, and head back up. So that's, I would say, an accurate sketch, although I did a really bad job going through the y-intercept. Sorry, guys. You can fix that on your sketch there. Okay. We got a little bit more curve sketching under our belts here. We got a lot more to do with curve sketching, to be honest. There's going to be some unique cases that come up that, you know, it kind of seems like we've got all the pieces put together, but there's going to be some, of course, exceptions to the rule moving forward. Well, before we get to some of that stuff, though, like I said, today's lesson is about something called Rolle's theorem and then eventually the mean value theorem. And Rolle's theorem is stated below here on the next page, and I think the diagram really helps us to understand that. So what's happening is if we have a function y equals f of x that's continuous at every point on this closed interval, a to b, and differentiable at every point on the interior, a, b, if this condition is true that f of a equals f of b equals zero, so you can see that below, f of a and f of b are both zero, then there is at least one number c between a and b such that the slope of the tangent at C, F prime of C is equal to zero. So if I'm going to go from one zero to another for a continuous and differentiable function, I'm going to have to, you know, reach a max or min value somewhere along the way to make that happen. So there's at least one. There may be more than one, depending on what function we're looking at. And what I'll tell you is that some definitions of Rolle's theorem in, in calculus textbooks don't have the condition where it equals zero. As long as f of a and f of b are the same, 
there has to be some value C that the slope of the tangent would equal zero at in order to get for, to a Y value that matches at F of A and F of B. Our textbook uses the definition where it's equal to zero, and that's, I would say, the most common version of Rolle's theorem. But you can extend this even if F of A and F of B are just the same, not necessarily zero. So here's an example. It says, is Rolle's theorem satisfied on the closed interval from negative two to two for the function x cubed minus four x? If so, determine all the values of c. Okay, so if this is satisfied that it's continuous and differentiable and all those good things, then we want to find all these values c such that the slope of the tangent would equal zero. All right, so let's kind of verify the conditions first. That's kind of an important step. So is this function continuous on the interval from negative two to two? X cubed minus four X, yeah, that's a polynomial function, no issues there or anywhere for that matter. This function is definitely continuous. Is it differentiable on the open interval from negative two to two? Yeah, I mean, this is a nice smooth curve, no sharp ouchy points that we have to worry about. So it's definitely differentiable at negative two to two on that open interval. And the last condition is, does f of negative two equal f of two? And does that equal zero? So if you plug in negative two for x, you'll get negative eight, and then negative two here would make that a plus eight. Yeah, that's zero. And then f of two would become eight minus eight, which is also zero. So this condition holds true as well. So whenever you do a Rolle's theorem question, first and foremost, you have to verify that these three conditions are met. Got to do that part of it. Once you've done that, now the algebra from here actually is pretty easy. So we want to first find the derivative at C, figure out what F prime of C is. So F prime of C would just be in this case, use your power rule, but replace all your X's with C's for now. So three C squared minus four is the derivative at C. I want to figure out, are there any values of C such that the slope of the tangent line there is equal to zero? And to solve this, we can add the four over, divide by three. So we get C squared equals four thirds, and then take the square to both sides. And the values of C that would satisfy this would be plus or minus two over radical three. I mean, we want to kind of keep in mind here is that are these values of C on the interval from negative two to two? And they do happen to both be on that interval. So both of these values of C, there would be two values such that over the interval negative two to two, we can draw a slope of the tangent line and it would equal zero at those points. Okay. You can certainly confirm this graphically. This would actually be a cubic function that has roots at zero and then plus or minus two. It looks something like that. So the values of C that we're talking about here are these points here, one at negative two over radical three and one at positive two over radical three, such that the slopes of those tangents are equal to zero. So that's a little bit about Rolle's theorem there. As long as it verifies the conditions, find the derivative at C, set it to zero, and check to just make sure your values of C are on the interval that was defined initially. All right, let's talk about the mean value theorem then. Mean value theorem is related to, but a little bit different than what we have for Rolle's theorem. So we still have some initial conditions. F of X has to be continuous on the closed interval A to B. It has to be differentiable on the open interval AB. If it's true that it's differentiable and continuous, then there is at least one number C between A and B at which this would be true. So how do I interpret this statement here? It's the derivative at C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Well, isn't that the slope connecting points A and B here? So what we're saying is that there's at least one point on the interval that the slope of the tangent line is gonna wind up equaling the slope of the secant line that connects the original endpoints A and B. In fact, in this case, it looks like there's more than one point, right? I showed you this point here, here's a value of C, but I bet we can even find a value along here such that if I draw the tangent line, the tangent line at this value of C would match the slope of the secant over here. So there may even be more than one, but there's at least one 
if the function's continuous and differentiable. And I think this picture does a good job justifying what we're saying in this theorem. So as long as it verifies the conditions, what are we gonna do? We're gonna find the derivative of the function at C, and we're gonna set that equal to the slope of the secant line that connects points A and B. And once I'm able to do that and solve for C, we'll see if there are any values that satisfy the mean value theorem there. So we're actually gonna use the same function that we just looked at a second ago, x cubed minus four x. And we know a lot about that already. So since it's the same function we just used for rules theorem, we know that it's continuous over negative two to two, that closed interval. And we also know it's differentiable on the open interval. Notice how there's one less condition to verify for, for mean value theorem here. We don't have to verify that we have, you know, the endpoints are the zeros. And actually, sorry about that, but I'm just looking over here and I'm gonna quickly change those twos into threes because we can, it's not a huge deal, right? But if we extend out to negative three to three, of course, this is still continuous and differentiable. Good save, Mr. All, look at that. All right, so yeah, we're extending this out a little bit. You'll see why in a second but it's still continuous and differentiable over those intervals. So how am I gonna approach this? Well, we have to find the slope of the secant. Okay, we're looking for f prime of c to equal the slope of the tangent at c, so f of b minus f of a over b minus a. All right, so your values of a and b are going to be the negative three and three there. So we need to find f of three and we need to find f of negative three and plug those in for our corresponding y values up here. So let's see, the f of three, three cubed is 27, and then minus 12 is 15. Negative three cubed is negative 27, and then negative four times negative three is a plus 12. So I think that gives you a result of negative 15. Makes sense, we definitely have some origin symmetry happening here. All right, so if I use those corresponding values, the slope of the secant would be 15 minus negative 15. Just change that to 15 plus 15. The difference in the values of A and B would be three minus negative three. And we're gonna set the slope of that secant line equal to the derivative slope of the tangent at C, which same function as before is gonna be three C squared minus four. So we wanna now solve where does three C squared minus four equal, what's that 30 over six? That's gonna be five. Are there any values of C that satisfy this over this interval from negative three to three? So if we add the four to the other side, three C squared now equals nine, and then C squared equals three, square root, square root. We get two possible values for C here. C could be positive radical three, C could be negative radical three, and we would find that at those values, uh, plus or minus radical three, that the slope of the tangent line there would equal the slope of the secant that connects x equals negative three and x equals positive three. And again, as a quick kind of reference here, it's the same graph as before. So we had negative two, zero and two as the roots. But remember, we're really looking at the secant from negative three to three. Okay. So if we're to connect that secant at negative three and positive three here, Okay. We know that there are two values of C such that the slope of the tangent at those values would equal the slope of the secant. So at negative radical three, what's that like negative 1.7 ish? And I know this is just a rough sketch, but if I'm trying to be accurate, the slope of the tangent there matches the slope of the secant. And at positive radical three, 1.7 ish, if I were to Plot that point and draw the tangent line. Look how nice that is. Okay, two such values of C such that the slope of the secant and then the slope of the tangents match up. Okay, so I'm actually gonna stop there and we'll talk about mean value theorem for these two examples, but why don't you guys go and try these? They actually go fairly quickly. They're pretty easy functions to work with. We've got X cubed and X squared. Make sure we're paying attention to the intervals over which we're going to verify the conditions. So remember, you first have to verify for NBT, mean value theorem, is it continuous and differentiable? Then once you've done that, compare the slope of the tangent to the slope of the secant that connects those. See if there are any values of C that satisfy the mean value theorem for each of these two cases. We'll go over that and then the first page of this notes. Next time I see you, let me know if you have any questions beforehand.